it's December. The, the winter is blowing in here in Michigan, but we've got Rachel, who is in Arizona, and Rick, who's in California. So you guys are going to bring the heat <laughs> to this discussion because we sure don't have any here in Michigan. Rick, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what we got today? Well, Rachel's got some ca cases specifically focusing on MI. Did you present these at ASAP this uh, past year? Some of them. Some of okay. these are from the ASAP presentation, supplemented a couple. Okay, yep. and we're also going to do a bunch of stuff uh, that's in the literature articles on COVID uh, sanctions and the like, and just, so there's a bunch there too. So we have a full issue. for. So let's get started, Rachel. Give us uh, the highlights of your cases. Sure. So we'll start with uh, first case is a Florida case from 2014, Richmond versus Adventist Health System. So this one, a woman, female, showed up to the emergency department complaining of chest pain. While she was there, she had what they referred to as a normal initial workup. We're not actually told what that means, but probably, presumably, an EKG, maybe a chest X-ray, troponins, all look just fine. But the decision was still made to admit her to the hospital. So uh, while she was waiting to be moved up to her hospital bed, she developed worsening chest pain. She told the nurse this, but the nurse did not tell the physician. And apparently there were standing orders that the nurse had access to to give her nitroglycerin and Ativan. And that's what the nurse did. And... Again, didn't tell the doctor. Uh, patient was never reevaluated. There was nothing documented in the chart. And when the patient eventually got moved to the floor hours later, she said, you know, by the way, I've had this terrible chest pain. It's much worse than when I got here. I told them in the emergency department, nobody did anything. So the hospital team got a stat EKG and she had a STEMI. And so she sued basically saying this should have been picked up earlier. And if it had been, my heart would be in much better shape. And that case ended in a $3 million verdict. Let me let me point out a couple of things here. She came in with chest pain. They did an EKG. It was clear, right, Rachel, the first yep. one? Yep. So we're talking about more chest pain, the nurse taking an action to give medications, and the nurse didn't repeat the EKG. Is that the is that the crux of this? Right. Didn't repeat the EKG, didn't tell the physician, no reevaluation done. Oh, God. Well, you know, just the idea of a standing order of nitroglycerin and Ativan together, whoever wrote those standing orders needs to have a little discussion uh, here. I thought that that was pretty wacky. Um, and cer certainly, if the doctor had written for nitroglycerin, PRN, pain, that would have been another matter. But I think that this doctor got blindsided here by the failure to communicate. Well, I think and in most departments, if you're giving out nitroglycerin because somebody has increased or the new onset of pain, usually that has to be reported to the doctor in charge, doesn't it, guys? I mean, that seems a little strange to me. Sometimes standing orders make me a little nervous to tell yes. you the truth. I think that's what this case gets at. And I think that this is probably uh, a maybe a slope that's gotten more slippery over even the past couple of years as, as our healthcare system's gotten more stretched. You know, we were kind of relying on different providers to do kind of expand their scope in ways that maybe we weren't comfortable with five years ago or three years ago, even, especially with COVID and um, you know, even not even a standing order, but a PRN order say that you wrote for, you know, four of morphine every two hours PRN. And, you know, they got it, they were doing fine. And then four hours later developed another episode of chest pain. You know, you could see a scenario where a nurse feels like, well, it's a, it, they already have it written for, I don't need to tell the doc. Right. You know, so I, I think this kind of highlights why communication there is key and maybe, and things like PRN orders and standing orders, orders are danger zones. Well, just the idea of mixing nitroglycerin and Ativan is like, <laughs> I haven't heard of that cocktail be before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was think sitting here thinking, I've really become old. I'm not giving that. Is this a new therapy for something that I don't know about? I mean, they seem like uh, un an unusual combo to me. Well, you know, especially now that we have the ability to extract these clots, then in fact, maybe sure her heart was uh, worsened by this. Although, it, it you know, to, to say that the outcome would have been easier, better that if they had identified this two hours sooner. Um, 
I guess they were successful in making that case because $3 million, I think, is a fair amount of money uh, for somebody who's having a pathologic process to begin with. And so the idea that it's it's worse because you didn't pick it up an hour or two ago, I think, is um, artful lawyering for sure. Yes, it's but, probably you know, I, artful. I guess, yeah. I guess the idea, too, is that you know, one of the residuals here is how much left ventricular ejection fraction do you have uh, when these things are over? And uh, I guess you could kind of make the case that time is uh, time is muscle. I think I've heard that before. Yes. I, ca I can't claim that one, but uh, <laughs> time, somebody says time is muscle. So I got it. Bad standing orders, um, I think, were was the key here uh, and the failure to communicate with the uh, physician. I don't know why somebody would feel, I don't want to bother them, you know, or something like that with something that is so p potentially consequential as chest pain. Well, another thing I think that's worth highlighting is I think first we're quicker to discount chest pain in women. And so this is a, a female who came in and had a completely normal initial workup and, you know, she was given Ativan. And I think that that's something we have to be really careful of is <laughs> labeling women who have a negative chest pain workup as anxiety driven. And it seems like she was a victim of that here. And I, I think that that is not uncommon. Well, you might've been able to prove that if you had standing orders for men and women that were different. <laughs> you know? Yes. I, I can't believe that, that Ativan was given as a standing order in chest pain patients, but you know, each, each hospital does something a little different. What I think is the real problem is sometimes the doctor does have to walk in occasionally once they've admitted and or they're, they're being admitted, they're on their way up. All of a sudden, we don't think about them very much. And I promise you this, when they're out of sight, they're out of mind. Yep. Uh, there's nothing as useful as a patient who's continuously looking at you and then giving you feedback like, you know, putting their hand on their chest, sweating, that sort of thing. Uh, that, she, uh, it causes you to do something, right? That woman was just faking the sweating. Yeah, it could this be faking anxiety the sweating. The sweating. It yeah. happens all the time, you know. Yep. Yeah, I and, think the other thing we didn't mention is the interpretation of EKGs. Uh, we did some literature reviews in the past, and uh, emergency physicians are not particularly stellar at doing this. And uh, I wonder whether the EKG was, uh, was in fact normal. I mean, we get a lot of help from these machines now that are reading them, but it also needs kind of like the, the eyes of a, a, a physician who really knows what they're looking for. I think if you learned anything about an EKG, I would say I would discount none of the arrhythmias really matter. Forget them, you know. Yep. If you should put your time into trying to understand what the abnormalities consistent with ischemia or, or, or infarction. By the way, the uh, the old teaching that uh, men are more likely to get MIs, all that sort of thing. I think that that was information from the 50s and the early 60s. If you looked at mm. smoking habits in females, smoking went up. Uh, is compared to men. Lots of things changed. I don't think my experience has been that that men have considerably more MIs than women at this point in time. I don't know what the latest numbers are, but women are having MIs at, at kind of the same rates, I believe. Well, I think that idea that women are discounted, uh, I think still exists, maybe, maybe not as much as it has, but I think it still happens. Yep. I still think men get about, get, have MIs about twice as often as women is the, the latest based on my, my Google that, search five seconds ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say about this case that I think it highlights is, uh, what you alluded to Greg, which is when you've admitted a patient, it's a little bit unclear who owns that patient. And this is something that comes up in our department fairly frequently. You know, something with a patient status changes. Who does that nurse tell? Do they tell the ED physician? Do they tell the hospital physician? And, you know, they're kind of in this purgatory. Nobody really wants to own them. And I think that you have to be really clear in your department or institution who's going to own that patient. Yep. You know, while they're, they're still there, no matter what you'd like to say or pretend, you know, well, they've been admitted. Yep. If they're still physically with you, at least claim them. 
at least go back in and see what's happening to your stuff. Because I'll tell you, I've seen that happen. The worst time is once they arrive upstairs and the house officer upstairs or who's ever in charge hasn't seen them, that's the difficult time. But you I know? don't think you can rely on like the the good judgment of the ED physician to do that. I think you really have to have a policy in place because you know you might admit the yes. patient, the hospitalist hasn't seen them, they put in a bunch of orders, then the patient says, "Oh, I'm itching from that med that the hospitalist orders." And it's, you know, does the ED physician go? They're kind of ornery because it wasn't even their order. I think unless there's a policy there, the right, you know, the right thing's not going to happen. So right. just make the policy and stand by it, I think is the the easiest thing. I don't think that this uh you said suggested that it may have be, be some issue at Mayo Hospital. I don't think it was Mayo Hospital. I think it was some other hospital that you were familiar with, but not Mayo Hospital. There's no, no Mayo works yeah. like like a, a finely uh, it's it's a watch. It's a Swiss made watch. <laughs> You're right. You're right. That's it was different. I was thinking of a different one. Right. You know, other people may hear this or could listen to this and look this up again. No, no, Mayo is you can't get any better than Mayo. Right. Okay. We have never right. had this issue. Next next case. All right. Next case. Kantorowski versus Lisi. This is a case from Connecticut in 2015. In this case, a 45-year-old guy came into the emergency department, not with chest pain, but with confusion was his primary complaint. He was known to have some type of brain tumor. And so he kind of had a, a workup related to that. But in the midst of this workup, at some point, somebody ordered an EKG, whether it was his physician or just kind of a reflex order. We don't really know, but he had an EKG done. He ended up getting admitted to the hospital with this confusion, which was related to his brain tumor. The EKG, nobody really noticed because I think it was almost an unintentional order, but it was read out by the computer as age indeterminate myocardial infarction. That was the generic computer read. Nobody followed up on it. There wasn't, you know, a cardiac evaluation while he was hospitalized. He didn't have a troponin done or anything. He wasn't complaining of chest pain. Um, he was in the hospital for his confusion. He he cleared up. He was discharged home. And then three days later, he died of a fatal MI. And his family sued and said, hey, you know, he had this EKG. You guys missed it. And this resulted in a $6.3 million verdict. Wow. <laughs> You're giving away a lot of money somewhere. Let me let me just say that to think that we're going to pick up every one of this is impossible. But if you have a reading sitting there out of the machine on the EKG, you've got to answer that reading somewhere. Somebody's got to acknowledge that they saw it and they they're thinking about it now. You might say, after thinking about it, nah, not related to the guy's current problems, or we'll repeat it. But what you can't do is ignore it. That's the problem with, an, with the automatic labs, the automatic EKGs. You don't want a finding sitting there that you haven't answered in some way, shape, or form. Uh, by the way, he may have had a bad course no matter what happened, but uh, you, you've got something sitting on the chart that's that somebody's going to find. Well, I don't, I don't think you can say that anymore now that people have been extracting clots from coronary arteries because there, you can make the case, had that been done in a timely manner, that there's unlikely that, that this outcome would have uh, occurred. So in the old days when people just got put in a bed, you know, and it's like you cross your fingers, uh, that was a different story. But now that you can clearly do something and it's time urgent, I think somebody said uh, uh, time is muscle. Did somebody yeah. say that? I think, I think somebody <laughs> We're said not that. doing but, that again, Rick. So you, you basically, and you know, I do think that a lot of this stuff is like reflexly ordered. Okay, the person's gonna be admitted. So they get all this crap that uh, is not related to their primary problem. And you didn't anticipate this being the case, and, right. and but but somebody took that EKG, uh, who should have had the foresight to just hand it to that physician and say, and let that physician kind of make the decision: uh, does it is it meaningful or is it not meaningful? Or are we going to pursue it? Or are we not going to pursue it? This but, is any time you order a lot of crap, somebody ought to look and see. You has you got to go down the list. 
and see what did we order and what did it say? And I think that happens a lot more than we're willing to admit it, that there will be a lab value stuck in there someplace. And, you know, it may be wrong. It may be spurious. It may be a lot of things. The only thing you can't do is ignore it. You have to answer it in some way, shape, or form. And I'll, I'll tell you, the EKG is is obvious. But, uh, you know, what does the average person get? 40 or 50 blood determinations or numbers on admission? Would That wouldn't be unusual. Yeah, you can see this thing of, though, well, they're getting admitted anyway. You, you see that a lot with surgical cases, like uh, somebody comes in, broke, broke their hip kind of thing. Well, okay, we're going to get all of this pre admission hospital workup kind of thing is, is unrelated to their broken hip, but you're doing the, the floor a favor because you're going to get all of this stuff that is ritually done prior to an <laughs> operation and nobody uh, really kind of thinks much about it because it's really not your concern. It's for the floor and that's that's where a problem can happen. Absolutely, it's a problem. $6 you million know, dollar I, problem. Yeah, I'm a great believer that we order way too much crap and the bottom line is, if you don't know why you're getting that, why are you spending somebody's money? The other thing is, if it's sitting there on the chart, you have to answer it. Well, you yeah, can't God forbid, ignore it. God forbid you're in an academic place where you don't seem to have to justify any test being ordered. I know. I know. God. The two takeaways I got from this were, I think Greg already said, but basically, you know, don't order the test if you don't need it because I think the EKG here was probably unnecessary and just created that liability exposure. And then second, if you have an abnormal result, like Greg said, you need to acknowledge it. Even if even if acknowledging it is just saying, you know, he has no chest pain and we, have, we got a troponin, it was negative. I think this is old. We're not going to follow up on it. Probably that would have, you know, mitigated the liability risks here. It's right. We, we can't really say, but acknowledging, I think, would have um, caused the the jury or judge whoever issued this verdict to look at this case in a less inflammatory way. Because I think right. when they did look at it, they said, geez, he had this suggestion of MI and it was completely ignored. How dare you? Six million dollars. Yeah, exactly. Number three. All right. Number three, Barazé v. Enlo. This is a case from Washington State, 2009. In this case, there was a 53-year-old guy came to the emergency department with chest pain. He had, a, uh, I would say, a fairly thorough workup. EKG, chest X-ray, troponin, CT angiogram, all of those things, all totally normal. Discharged home with reassurance, all the things look great, you're good to go. 27 days later, he had an MI. And he sued the emergency physician saying, you know, okay, you did all those things, but you didn't get a second troponin. You didn't complete my workup. If you'd gotten that second troponin, you know, then maybe I could have had some really real reassurance that things were okay, or you would have identified that actually with that episode of chest pain, I was having an incident. And uh, that that was kind of the crux of the lawsuit is you did not get a second troponin. We don't know anything about the timing or duration of his chest pain leading up to that, but that was the allegation. Yep. Hmm. I don't really know whether CT uh, coronary angiogram trumps the troponin. Um, it's uh, not likely, but if this guy had, you know, 50% occlusions or, or less, it would be kind of hard to fault them. So I don't really know what the uh, CTA uh, actually showed. You and know, it the heart. Say, it didn't say it was a coronary angiogram. You know, it was just a C, like a, it could have just been a CTPE rule out for all we know. Well, then they probably got the wrong angiogram. <laughs> well, it, it's very unusual to get one enzyme. I, I mean, isn't it? Isn't don't they usually come as buddies? I mean, don't you usually mm. get I mean, one down the not road? Not necessarily. Back well, in 2009, they were like zero or six hours, or sometimes eight or 12, depending on where you work. So it was pretty right. common that people were trying to decide, you know, hey, is the nature of this guy's pain such that I can get the reassurance I need from one? So I think it was pretty common, actually. Mm. Well, now that we have the hard score, it only asks you to do one troponin, uh, inc uh, incidentally. Although yeah. 
this is kind of weird. The heart score asks for one. The heart pathway asks for two. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. Well, I, I, you can understand that will buy some time. Sometimes time is really more important than the, than the subsequent test result. But, you know, the, so now the two is kind of like the routine for sure. And yes. you can understand why. And th this is a much better test than what was done in the past when we ordered enzymes. I mean, this is just stuff out of the heart cells leaking out kind of thing that, that is uh, pretty sensitive for some heart cell damage. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, ischemic damage. It could be, you know, you can get it from a, a electrocution or you can get it for from myocarditis or other kinds of reasons that your heart's leaking out this stuff. But yeah, I, I, guess, um, I guess he could have said that. that. I guess he could have. Yeah, the other thing is, 27 days later, he um, crumps or he has a problem. Um, that's a long time. I mean, I, I can't believe that there wasn't something happening in between that we that we don't know about. I mean, did he have more chest pain? Did he see his doctor? What happened here, Rachel? Yeah, you, you couldn't well, envision a case going to uh, like this without being referred to some doctor. Well, then again, the, the heart score heart pathway is designed to identify patients with a 30 day risk of a major adverse cardiac right. event. Right. So it, this is really that patient. Although, you know, you know we're trying to like identify when they said that 30 day MACE occurrence stuff, it was like. My dog is. Can you hear my dog in the rug? No, you drive me nuts here. <laughs> All right, Rick, mark the time on this, will you please? So the idea of having a uh, negative. Uh, All right, I'm sorry. The idea of having a negative uh, issue here with regard to your first troponin is. Um, no, let me start that again. The idea of having a 30 day outcome that is uh, considered by the uh, heart score I thought, geez, that's not very long. I mean, you know, what if you have, uh, this is your first episode of angina. Angina is not going to cause any of these things to be positive, yet you st may still have to, something wrong that is going to show up on day 31 kind of thing. Right. There have been subsequent studies, however, that showed we looked at a year out and they still did remarkably well. So I got a little bit uh, a better feeling about that. But I thought 30 days, I mean, is that all you're going to grant me is 30 days and the rest I'm on my own? Well, also, they're getting risk stratified for follow-up, which is supposed to happen within that 30-day time frame. Oh, sure. Right. Um, the other thing about this, as far as the one troponin or not, I would say that I get one troponin on a large percentage of my patients. I, I stick with a single troponin. And that's because, you know, their story is they had chest pain yesterday or, you know, they had a multi-hour period of chest pain that ended yesterday, or it's been going on for two days or something, you know, to that extent. So I feel like if I get a troponin and, you know, their chest pain was 12 hours ago, there's really no point in me repeating that troponin two hours later if their first one is negative or undetectable. Well, doctor, what is the harm? I mean, once you... I, I, there, this further on in this month's issue, there is this issue about one versus two uh, kind of thing. I think that if you, I think almost, I hate to say, I wouldn't say this is like always, but I think if you committed to order one, that you're you're best off ordering two. And um, I guess you haven't made any errors in your judgment about who needs one. Um, but I think from a risk management point of view. You buy some time where the patient's going to be there and you can keep an eye on them, see if anything develops. And you do this other test, which helps reassure you, the patient, and everybody else. But if you feel that confident in the beginning, I'm not sure you should be ordering one. You know? Yeah, and, and maybe that's the real point. But realistically, I mean, these are super low risk people who have been sitting in the waiting room for four hours before I even see them. And by, if I order a second troponin two hours later, it takes an hour to result. There are three more hours in the ED and that time is like very valuable. So I feel confident enough that I'm going to see somebody else or a couple more people during that three hour time period instead of, you know, getting you're, you're, that minimal you're not talking reassurance. About the, 
Mayo ER where people may be waiting. That Never. To, and no. There was another ER that you're familiar with. <laughs> Mayo yes. ER seen immediately. Now, Rick, uh, be nice here. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this is an exemplary department. Right. All right. Yeah. So I think, no, but really like patient flow is something I think everybody's thinking about. And so I do think there is, you know, indirect harm yes, to just getting the second troponin just because you can. And I mean, realistically, uh, people are getting one troponin in a lot of situations. And so with regard to this case, I think it's okay if you think that you just need one troponin, but what you should do is explain why, why you think it was appropriate, why they don't that would, benefit that from would getting the second the, one. Or of shared decision-making. In the no. paper? No. No. Not you don't have to do shared decision making for diagnostic decisions. Yes. You uh, like, can't. Yeah, I, I can't, agree. I agree. I, I, misunder I misunderstood <laughs> that part. Yes. I just have shared decision making on the brain right now. You must. Uh, no. Yeah. I shouldn't say that. You don't need to inform consent for diagnostic. You can do shared decision making, but this is not something that I would like. No, I, I agree. I, 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 I'm totally off limits here. I might even cut this part out of the, uh, of the whole tape here kind of thing. Go ahead, Rick. Who would even think of asking a patient, what do you think about getting a second troponin? I went, yeah, I, yes. I, even I wouldn't do that. No. I'm sorry. All right. Fourth case. You ready? Ready. Yeah. Okay. Fourth case. Uh, this one is from Henry Ford. I think. Yep. Henry Ford Health System, 2010. Yep. So in this one, a 61-year-old male who had had an MI with stents placed three, year, three months previously came into the emergency department. Um, let's see. With basically symptoms of a variety of symptoms, abdominal pain, some dizziness, nausea, vomiting, weakness, chill, shortness of breath, loose stools. And basically he said, this is what, when he had his MI several months ago, these are what his symptoms were. That was basically the complaint. But despite hearing that, they didn't do any cardiac workup. And patient was told he probably had some type of bacterial infection, discharged home, died of an MI the next day. Mm. There does seem to be some proximity that is distressing in terms <laughs> well, of his ER visit and his outcome. But yeah, I, this is, the, the problem here is this is the way I presented the last time I had uh, a cardiac problem. I'm presenting that way now. It, it, I think the kind of the onus falls on the doc to say, okay, we're probably going to have to keep you for a couple more hours and see what's going on. But if he said, this is the way I present with my cardiac lesions, it, that's hard to ignore. I think, Rachel. Yeah, I think you there's know, just like, I, I think the best way to avoid any trouble with this is to what we would do in the old days is just put that chart right back in that rack. Uh, this is, <laughs> you know, when you have every symptom in the book, you know, um, I guess I guess you have should have a relatively low um, threshold for doing an EKG. It's not that big a deal kind of thing, and um, you may get surprised. For sure. Um, but, you know, diarrhea, I'm not so sure that it's associated with MIs particularly kind of thing. Yep, I, um, it's not. But now that we've got, co I mean, maybe this is his COVID coming on. Maybe it's the other things. The problem is three months ago I was here and it was an MI. And I don't know, I, I'm not that ca that cavalier yet that I'm willing to say, well, it felt like your last MI. Oh yeah, well, that's kind of hard to ignore. Yeah, I have quite a bit of respect when people tell me this is what my last ex felt like. I feel like there's some obligation, you know, clinically as well as legally, I feel like my risk is now heightened if I don't chase X. You know, yes. obviously there's some limitations, but that's obviously what their concern is they have some basis for that concern. I, I better have some reason why I'm not going to share that concern with them. And I think in this case, it's hard to justify, especially, you know, abdominal pain, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, 
weakness, shortness of breath, all of those things we do associate with MI. So yeah, maybe the loose stools is a little I, bit I was, off. I was the rest focusing of it. on the loose stools. You know, I ignored all that other stuff. Just focus. Yeah, on the I know. But yes, the rest I, of it is right there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I think when people say, you know, the idea, I, I've got a lot of kind of raised eyebrows from nurses, like we're going to get what for what, but you know, when people tell me that's my anginal equivalent, they don't use those words, but you know, I, I will chase that because it's easy. Why not? Uh, Dr. Linder is ordering the kitchen sink again. Yeah. But it's not the kitchen sink for this is the thing, right? It's not scans. It's a, it's a tr trope and an EKG and we're doing that for every other patient anyway. So yep. this is a high risk patient who says, Hey, this feels like my high risk thing. Fine. Yep. Get your trope and your EKG. Good point. This case uh, settled, settled for 50,000. That's not very much money. No, uh, no, not at all. Bad lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's pick up some of the, uh, stuff that uh, we've been reading over the last, uh, couple of months, uh, I st stumbled across an article by uh, Bill Sullivan, who's a DOJD who has been on our show before. He wrote a paper in an article in the September issue of Risk Emergency Medicine Monthly. And he pointed out that, you know, uh, we're, we're hearing a lot about our medical boards responding to these physicians who are giving out all this misinformation or disinformation. Are they having their licenses in some way restricted or are they being sanctioned, et cetera, et cetera. And he takes a position that I kind of uh, didn't think about it at all. Uh, he takes a position that it may be inappropriate for a medical board to sanction a, a physician and threaten his or her practice when the, there are few absolutes in medicine. In fact, sometimes what is the, the point of view that goes against the common belief turns out to be the corrective belief. Like everybody knew that ulcers were caused by uh, uh, something other than it was stress or whatever. But now we know that it was bacteria all along. And when we said it was like, it wasn't due to stress, it's due to bacteria, they would say, are you serious? That's That's got to be some kind of wacko misinformation, disinformation kind of thing. And they were right. And everybody else is uh, kind of wrong. So this, he suggests that this this makes it very uh, tricky for the medical board to sanction a physician. He believes that because there are no absolutes in medicine and sometimes things that are thought to be wrong turn out to be right, and that, in fact, this may be a violation of the first, fifth, and 14th amendments after you go after these doctors, he's suggesting that this is not the purview of um, medical boards and that, in fact, doctors who feel that they have been uh, unjustly attacked can go after these medical boards, sue them, sue the individual members of the medical board, and uh, just make their lives pretty unpleasant. You know, we've been told in the past, and I think it's kind of true, uh, if you get into a malpractice case and you lose, and there's several million dollars changing hands, okay, well, that's bad. If you get into trouble with a medical board, that that's potentially worse because they can extract your license, limit your practice, and losing your license is potentially the worst thing that can happen to a doctor professionally. Uh, he, he pointed out that these uh, medical board actions are sometimes not a, in agreement with what the community thinks. He pointed out there, there was a Republican lawmaker who wanted to disband the Tennessee Medical Board unless it rescinded its policy on the spread of misinformation. And now you, you would anticipate that would come from a Republican uh, lawmaker. But in any case, in California, a member of the medical board was followed, this is a physician, followed by four men wearing clothing emblazoned with, quote, America's Frontline Doctors, which is an organization trafficking in COVID-19 conspiracy theories, and they promoted things like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. <laughs> and it was led by a physician by the name of Dr. Simone Gold, who was arrested for breaching the Capitol on January 6th, though, by the way. And and on November 30th of this year, the B California Medical Board renewed her license. So they are pretty uh, careful about not going down this slope. But I think all the, all the medical community or the uh, lay community said, well, why don't they do something about these doctors? And it's just not so easy. Yep. 
Uh, it, let, let me just tell you, Rick, that as you watch everything progress, uh, are there people who have had all of their shots, done all the right thing, who get COVID? Yes. Are there people who have done nothing right and still come down with some COVID? Yes. I think... I think we have to be very careful, you know, treading on these paths because we don't know the exact right answer. I mean, does the mask work? Well, kind of depends on whose literature you're looking at. I, I think uh, Fauci is is uh, b better than we think, better than, and maybe better than he knows because he will sit back and say, no matter what we do at this moment in time, it's going to work its way through down to a certain number of things. Yeah, it's good to use your mask. It's probably good not to, for everybody to hang around the same dining room table if you have it. But the positives, particularly with medications for this problem, are very small. I, I don't think this is a simple matter at all. Rachel, what do you think? I don't know. This is, it's a messy issue. I don't know that I'm, I feel strongly about it. I can recognize both sides. The, uh, you know, the board is there. Their primary job in every state is to protect the public. And I think to that end, what they would like to see is physicians kind of using a unified voice and kind of behaving in a unified way. And what they're trying to stop is what they see is destructive behavior where some physicians are, uh, you know, providing these opposing viewpoints. And while I recognize that there's some controversy about the effectiveness of masks or whatnot, uh, I think in general, like if the medical community has decided you know, this is what the evidence shows. This is what we want to be doing. I would say the boards do have the ability. I mean, they, they do. They have the authority to say, this is what we expect, the views we expect physicians to be espousing. They have the legal authority to do that. You know, whether or not they should is a different question, but they have the authority to do it. Um, and then this argument, well, maybe they shouldn't because what if those, what if the evidence changes that's a hard one for me to swallow because you could apply that to literally anything. Like what if tries try applying that to some other treatment? Like what if there's some physician out there who, you know, is treating leukemia with Lasix or he's giving TPN to all his gastroenteritis or he's giving growth hormone to all these short kids, you know, is he going to say, well, you can't, you know, sanction me because just because this isn't what the mainstream does, you know, sometimes the mainstream changes. So, you know, you can't like so you, therefore you can't intervene that's kind of the argument that it sounds like I, I didn't read the article but that's the argument that it sounds like dr sullivan made so i think if you stretch that and try to apply it in other situations it kind of falls apart so i have a hard time buying that argument although there are all degrees of gradation here i mean the right. examples that you gave are you know uh off the chart kind of thing but there are these subtleties and uh yeah, I, I agree. I don't know whether we're, we're in subtle, subtle territory when we talk about hydroxychloroquine or not, but I think the uh, circumstances now are so are so different than they had been in the past with the, the you know 800,000 people dying of this disease, and I think there is some obligation on the part of the medical community to try to do everything they can, and this is really not a time to talk about what your rights are. We got people dying, and so... You, I don't really want to hear about your argument about I don't I, I I don't want to be mandated to take a vaccine and all of these cops and firemen who are not doing it. It's like what are you what are you guys thinking about? And I think there what? are mechanisms to have a public front that goes along with the existing evidence yet maintain a you know private or professional debate. So if we say you know well scientifically there's still some question about you know on the margins who benefits from this or what the greatest benefit is fine. We can have that debate in professional circles, but you know, to the public, what we want them to hear is yes, this vaccine is effective. Yes. We're doing masks until we, you know, have evidence that says differently. And I think that's mm -hmm. really where the boards are standing. And I don't have a problem with that right now, but I think, you know, their issue is 
those debates that some of these physicians are starting are very public and um, it, it's really uh, harmful, not helpful and, 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 and non-professional and the professionalism is the board's job to uphold. And I think the real problem is not so much there are people who agree that it works 65% of the time or 75% of the time. What you don't want is people who carry the imprimatur of the board getting out there giving really bad information. Uh, and, oh, it causes uh, uh, myocarditis in 20% uh, of children who get it and all these sorts of things. None of that, none of that is real. And we do need to act against that. And, uh, and you can't believe some of the things which are, are printed online about the effects of the vaccine. If the vaccines were only as power positive or powerful as some of these people think. Uh, but, but quite frankly, um, the anti-vaccine people are making shit up about what it actually does. I don't know whether, you know, here in Michigan, we follow all that stuff as are there side effects, this, that, and other thing. Actually, it's been pretty benign as far as uh, side effects here, at least here in the Midwest. Well, aren't you in a kind of a pickle right now with your state and the number of cases that you have? I mean, you're you're well, one of the worst states going right now. We, we have more than we should. And, you know, we have all the usual things that you ought to have. We have a governor who's in favor of giving out the shots. We have, you know, all the people coming up with rules and regs and all that kind of stuff. It hasn't been easy. And, and I think the, the real public health wonks uh, are a little bit, they're a little bit surprised too. If you look at the map of the United States, why certain places as opposed to others, I have no idea, Rick. Rachel, what do you think? Yeah, we can, why, yeah why don't we move on to uh, sh this We're article not, on should doctors lose their licenses? Or is that just more of the same? It, it's more of the same. We're not moving very far. Okay. All well, right. It, 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 but it does raise an interesting question as to... Where does your, where, who actually controls your practice and what you're going to do? If we look back in the past, and just going back to the times that I've been in medicine, we've been wrong on certain things. And uh, so let's, let's just make sure if we're going to start sanctioning and doing things, we have some pretty good evidence because it's painful. Well, we've been wrong, but I think, you know, historically the debate has been more in the, within the professional circles, as opposed to kind of these public outbursts that are maybe more attention seeking and potentially harmful to, to patients. And so I think that there is, there are avenues to have more of a unified front from physicians you know, to act in accordance with available evidence while at the same time continuing the debate and searching for better evidence in the professional circles. Yeah, tough problem. I think that uh, I, I would lean on, the, uh, I think, where you are. I, your position is, I think, the, the stronger to defend for sure. Uh, last thing on this COVID topic is um, you got to really be careful about crossing the line when it gives, comes to giving out exemptions, because all these people are filing religious exemptions, and they want their doctor to give them medical exemptions that they don't have to have do this, that, or the other thing. And uh, this talks about this article talks about uh, a doctor who is sending out pre-signed exemption forms uh, where you could avoid testing, mask wearing, and vaccinations. To anyone who sent her a self stamp, a self a stamp addressed uh, envelope, as always, she wanted a Manila envelope. It had to, it had to be Manila, and it had to have a stamp on it. It didn't cost her anything. She would stuff it with all of these exemption forms and send them out. They were all pre-signed by her, and she didn't charge anybody for these exemption forms. So this is kind of like the idea of physicians 
really getting out there and making it known that not only are they against uh, all of this uh, business with regarding COVID, they are basically going to facilitate uh, getting around all of the uh, measures that have been put in place to uh, protect the citizens. And so this doctor, obviously, doctor's license was suspended. Uh, they did an emergency meeting of the board because they thought this doctor was just way out of line. And so it's, it's kind of surprising what physicians will do when they have a belief that um, fundamental rights are being uh, stepped on, even though they're wrong, necessarily wrong. They'll, they'll, they'll basically be willing to go out there and make it clear that uh, they're against it. And uh, here's what we're going to do uh, as well. We're going to give you these uh, free exemption forms. Anyway, we're going. This is the end of the COVID discussion for uh, this month. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I think it's uh, interesting. I think some physicians forget about the board out there. Like there's this board looming in your state, and their their regulatory powers are actually pretty broad. Like if they think what you're doing stinks a little. They can stop it. You know, if you look at the Medical Practice Act in your state, it's really broad. It's open to interpretation. And basically, if they don't like it, they can stop it. And they have a lot of means to do it. And I just I think that we forget about that because we kind of people get tied up in the legal stuff like, well, I'm not breaking any laws. And that's kind of irrelevant for most of what we do. Most of what we do, you know, that's bad, doesn't break any laws, but it does break, you know, it could potentially cross professional boundaries, ethical boundaries, and that's what the board is enforcing, and it, it's up to their interpretation. So. If you look at the board here in Michigan, if if you look at over the last 20 years as to what they've taken action on, um, about 60 or 70 percent of it was drugs. It was medication writing. It was uh, stuff that you and I, if you know, if we ever written a prescription for Vicodin, yes. Um, but we haven't written 50 prescriptions a day for Vicodin, and we haven't done th this and this and this. I mean, the board does a, a useful job. There's no question about that. I think I think there are gray areas, and uh, there are things that are going to be challenged. But in general, when the board takes an action, it's usually at least my experience and when I've had to testify and be involved in these things, it's pretty egregious stuff. Uh, if you honestly think that that uh, a doctor can write for 2,000 Vicodin tablets in, in a month, uh, fine. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you what, it's that kind of egregious stuff. It's not seven more pills for grandma well, that, that somebody's talking about. Well, I wouldn't necessarily agree that it's, it's all that egregious. It, yeah. it, some of it is much more uh, subtle. Like uh, I was in, uh, involved in a case, not personally, but I was a witness in a case where a, a, a young uh, a teenager claimed that the physician uh, examined her a little bit too inappropriately. And so that went to court. It, that was uh, It was not a malpractice case. This is a criminal case. Right. Um, and there is this line between malpractice and criminal, uh, which you need to be really careful about. Uh, if you get involved in a cri this criminal case, this physician had to have all of his female related visits uh, chaperoned at the hospital where he was on the medical staff. They also had to have some kind of notices given out to all the women at his practice, which can you can see which would basically destroy a practice. Uh, if they if they uh, did that, so you got to really be really careful. I was involved with two doctors who were accused of uh, two intimate exams being done on the, on young females. I uh, any case, I found a JAMA article that looked at 400 discipline about 400 disciplinary actions taken against uh, California physicians and categorized what types of behaviors those actions were taken for. I just thought it was interesting. So negligence or incompetence was the most common category, about a third of them. Then uh, alcohol or other drugs, 15%. Inappropriate prescribing practices, 11%. Inappropriate contact with patients, 10%. Fraud, 9%. And then that, that was the end of that article, the categories. I had just 
looked up some examples of other disciplinary actions and I saw one article popped up about it came up a couple of years after the fact that somebody had cheated on their board exam and they just got their license yanked by the board you know again not illegal but if you're behaving badly the board can kind of act however they see fit depending yes. on how ticked they are at you yep so you want to tell us about the half of LaRoche oh uh, yeah Lou? sure Okay, so this was again in Emergency Physicians Monthly brought to us by Dr. Sullivan back in April 2020. And this is kind of the continuing the saga of Tamiflu. So this goes back to in 2014, uh, there was a false claim suit brought on behalf of the U.S. government and 29 states against Hoffman LaRoche basically alleging that Tamiflu was brought, brought to market uh, fraudulently. Well, there was, there was a, the, an allegation that was brought to market fraudulently that basically um, they had the evidence to suggest that it was not effective for flu, yet they kind of hid all that evidence and published only the evidence suggesting that it was and kind of misled the government. And you know, in doing so, got the government to basically stockpile, spend a bunch of money stockpiling these meds up and profit a bunch from that. Yeah. Uh, Hoffman uh, LaRoche, by the way, um, the United States isn't the only place where they have, uh, they've had to fight this battle. Um, Australia went after them for the exact same reason as to how that data was put forward. Uh, this is this isn't just a U.S. or a Canada problem. This is around the world. What do you claim and what can you actually prove? And that's the uh, that's where all of this came down was <laughs> they were claiming more than they could prove, I think. Yeah. So yeah go go ahead. ahead. I don't know that we can get into the nuances of this, this suit, but it fundamentally related to... Uh, a false claims uh, uh, suit and the uh, economic potential. Plus, now the, all of these governments have all of these this Tamiflu uh, sequestered away and ready to be given out at, at, at the uh, next pandemic or the whatever. And um, but it's, it's all a, it's fired. a drug in search of a disease <laughs> is the problem. Well, uh, and and. And what they claim it actually did, at least the Australian government thought they claimed way more than they could could prove. The issue now is that all of this stuff is uh, expired. Yeah. All of these billions of dollars of Tamiflu sitting at a secret warehouse someplace ready to be distributed to the American people uh, is expired. And, and then what, what are the liabilities of dealing with giving out expired medicine, spec especially when we know that the expiration date has really very little to do when it really expires. But that, that's another fly in the ointment here. We're talking about some serious dollars. Uh, whistle These are whistleblower suits the, where you get them um, and the government decides whether they're going to uh, uh, take, in, take part in the suit. And once they do that, they're going to pay all the bills. Um, these whistleblowers get like 30%. And uh, there's also this issue of treble damages. So they were claiming 1.5 billion uh, in their law in their award. Well, had the triple damages been awarded, it would have been 4.5 with 30% or 25% going to the whistleblower. Not bad, not bad uh, as an incentive to kind of get you to kind of squeal on things that you think are appropriately squealed on. Yeah, it says here the government, that's why the number is 1.5. The government stockpile cost $1.5 billion. Uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, there's there was all this stuff about Tamiflu is not as good as they said it was. And, and if you give it to people who are hospitalized, it doesn't really change the outcome. And, but on the other hand, there are all of these uh, organizations saying, if you get somebody who's admitted to the hospital, no matter whether it was 48 hours or more or less, that you ought to give it to anybody who's coming into the hospital, essentially. And that failure to do so may be in some way thought to be related to their outcome. 
And now the CDC is basically saying that, and the Infectious Disease Society of America is saying, saying this, some of that. So these patients who come into the hospital, you know, it's implied that, they're, that they either have a lot of um, risk factors in terms of what may cause them to deteriorate, or they have a really bad case when they're, when they're being admitted. Uh, they say, and, and there's a whole bunch written about it, I don't want to go into a, a lot of the specifics, but it basically says, you got somebody coming into the hospital, you, you better give them uh, this drug no matter when uh, they're coming in, whether day five, day six, doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, Rick. And I think if you don't, I think that you're you're subject to some criticism at least. I I've heard that argument for years. On that basis, they all get a, get a chocolate malt when they come in. Well, it probably isn't going to hurt them, and 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 uh, who knows? It may make them happier. The bottom line is we can't fall into that trap because then. Uh, every damn thing down the pike will be given. There'll be 20 drugs you got to stick in their mouth when they head into the department. I I think we we've got to keep keep the 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 lines of science here to some degree. Well, show me show me where you've really you, improved the outcomes. You want to we talk haven't... to the Infectious Disease Society of America about your points of view on this, or the CDC <laughs> about your point three points of view on this. This is not the same as chocolate milkshake when these guys get behind it. Yeah, and I know. It, it is one of these things where it is probably not viewed as particularly harmful, uh, especially if you're quite sick. So yeah. you can see their point of view. Uh, yes, it's a stretch. I acknowledge it's that. A if you're going to be per particularly aggressive about, well, what does the literature say about that? Uh, you're going to have a hard time necessarily defending it. But these organizations are the top two when it comes to infectious disease treatment. So I don't know that I kind of, if, if you didn't give it, I think that you would have some right to be kind of annoyed. Yeah. What do you think, Rachel? I, yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Thank with you very you. much. I appreciate yeah. that. You know. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Oh, we can, I don't have deep thoughts on it. Yeah, we're going to go to back to a briefly, briefly, briefly a COVID related thing that should have been up put up uh, sooner. This is about uh, crisis standards of care. We talked about this, I think, in some prior issues. Sure. So this was so crisis standard of care, I think, is something that many states have developed or many states hospitals, probably more broadly than they were aware of. We pulled up from Idaho specifically, which published on their website, their specific crisis standards care, which is basically saying in the event that our resources become so strapped, presumably due to COVID and all the other demands on them that we can't care for all the people that are needing care, how are we going to um, allocate resources among all the people that need them and kind of stratify uh, you know, who gets them and who doesn't, which is kind of getting into a bit of an ethical quandary that I think nobody really wants to be in. And so they've laid out uh, plainly for everyone to see kind of uh, how they intend to go about doing that. And that's actually what I was just trying to poke through and decode while you guys were talking about Tamiflu. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, that, that was good. That was a wasted 10 minutes on our part, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, Rick, no, no. Rick, Rick, did you buy stock in Tamiflu or anything like no, that? No, yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Because it, it, I, everybody who's got a product thinks this is going to be the way to go. We just need to be a little careful. Uh, you know, I thought we were, but and in, in any case, this is uh, this. All of these states, I think that there's a, a bunch of them cropping up now that are because some of these states are really having a problem now, basically are saying we're now operating under this crisis standard of care, which fundamentally relates to the potential of life years that they want to save. And so if you have a 30 year old and a 70 year old, you're going to go treat the 30 year old fundamentally. But, un but unfortunately some of those 30 year olds never got the immunizations and that's a pisser. Yeah. Because the, the care is going to be given to the 30 year olds, even though the, the 70 year old got 15 immunizations, doesn't matter, kind of thing. 
And and I think there are a lot of controversial pieces of this. So for example, they basically they look at, you know, is this patient critically ill or not? And then then they use the SOFA score to really mm-hmm. to, yes. to categorize people, which I think a lot of people are gonna bristle at appropriately. But that's like their main way that they're forming categories here is the SOFA score. Uh so anyway, everybody, you know, if we get in the situation, everybody's going to have to come up with some objective measurement or probably will end up trying to come up with some, you know, objective way to do this. So you're not doing it on a person by person basis. And and so at least Idaho's put theirs up and, uh, you know, your institution probably has it lurking somewhere if you're not aware of it already. Yeah, actually, we pulled up the Arizona one uh, not too long ago. They're all basically uh, substantial documents in terms of their sheer volume. Uh Speaking of Arizona, there's a story in Emergency Department News that was published October 2021, so just a couple of months ago, about a bill that was passed in Arizona protecting physicians from being retaliated upon should there be a um, what that was believed to be a, a uh, action taken because of what a physician did. In this case. If you're talking about actions that relate to the protection of patients or safety issues or inadequate staffing or training of staff or lack of necessary equipment, things like that that relate to the outcome that patients may receive, that if you complain about that, you know, in the past, you could just, you're, you, if you were in a, a group and the CEO said, I, I don't like, I don't want to hear from that. I don't want that person on his schedule anymore. And they have just a, pretty much the right to do that in most contracts, uh, that would happen. You would be retaliated upon. So people keep their mouths shut because they want to maintain their job. So this is a law drafted and, and proposed by Dr. Amish Shah, an emergency physician who was recently elected to the Arizona House of Representatives. Congratulations, Dr. Shah. Uh, this is something that ASEP has really uh, supported in the past, but Unfortunately, it has to be each state has to do it on their own, uh, and, and because this is not really a federal issue, this is re- related to uh, what's happening in individual states. This this person, um, this this bill, I think, is really specifically directed to um, people who have a complaint, but it's not a complaint that it relates to anything other than the potential harms that would come to a patient because of of the inadequacies of the departments. But you know, it's really it's really sad because we're so used to working with inadequacies in terms of is is the staffing adequate? Is, is are all those people in the waiting room are they is that because we don't have an adequate sca- staff or is it an issue because 20% of the nurses called in sick today, which all the hospitals are dealing with all the time. So it's kind of like the hospitals don't have an easy job of dealing with a lot of these uh, issues that physicians could bring up pretty much in every ER. There's there's something that is a problem. You're yeah, holding I, admitted patients or there's a, this issue about, you know, critical care patients who are being held in the emergency department. They're known to have a higher incidence of death than not, uh, especially if they're held more than eight hours in the emergency department. So there's all of these kinds of things that a lot of us tolerate. Um, not necessarily for the right reasons. This really provides protection for people like that Raymond Bravant, who was the Missouri physician who who brought up the kind of same concerns back in his local M care subsidiary back in, I think, St. Louis or one of the suburbs who said, gosh, I really don't feel like it's safe that I'm responding to codes in the hospital, yet also I'm the only physician, you know, to to do screening, these EMTALA screening exams in the ED. Uh, and then he was subsequently fired for that. This law, had it been in place, would have protected him from getting fired. And he's probably really happy they didn't have that in Missouri because now he's chilling with his $26 million verdict. But Yeah, all the appeals have been used up. He's got the money now. Yeah. Yep. I don't think he needs to worry about going to the codes on the floor anymore. You know, this is something that we did in our emergency department. It had a single doctor and... Uh, I thought, geez, if I had thought of this, you know, I could have probably made a lot of money here. Yeah. This guy was just smarter than I was, <laughs> but uh, about this because we did this for probably, yeah. probably 20 years. We would go to the codes on the floor and leave the ER. 20 we years did after that all college the time. started. 
A lot of I us could have been that. sitting here in you know twenty six million dollars. You could have been. Rick I could have been a contender. Just understand <laughs> that each one of these depends on the facts involved in the case. There is no simple answer. There will always be in in small Michigan departments at two o'clock in the morning, one day or two days, uh, you know, a year. When you're overwhelmed, I mean, it's not simple <laughs> when you run a business that takes in everybody. You know, we take in all comers. This, these aren't scheduled. Listen, it's not simple. Did you yeah. have a doctor on call, Greg? Hmm? Did you have a doctor on call when we you had this, when you were yeah. a single doctor ER? Uh, yes, Most we did. They yeah. want parts of being on call. Yeah, and and. It, but it it was never simple. You know, it's always if you if you're in a big hospital where they have more people, it's not the same as being in the middle of Ishpeming, Michigan. Yeah, I worked at a single coverage hospital my entire professional life, and yeah. uh, we were expected to, uh, to run the codes. And I think that that was kind of like you, you ought to have a doctor run the code, frankly, and or or a PA or NP or somebody like that who can intubate and knows what the ACLS algorithms are. But um, if I just thought of this before, I could have I could have been a contender. I could have been I could have been there for like five days and say I'm out of here because you're making me go to these codes on the floor and I got to deal with them, Tala. I can't yeah, be two places yeah. at once. Hey, I got two. Um, I got two quotations here. In the October issue of uh, Medical Malpractice Insights, there was a, a, a there was a case of a middle-aged woman who had 10 out of 10 right lower quadrant abdominal pain and 19,000 white count, and degenerating fibroids on her transvaginal ultrasound. And the uh, diagnosis several days later was a ruptured appendix, appendix. And abscess. Surprise! Yeah, surprise! Surprise! Uh, she wound up with multiple surgeries, a colostomy, and um, in discussing this case, uh, Chuck Pilcher, who's the uh, editor of that newspaper, said that there are two important quotations that apply to this case. The first one was, this is from Dr. Uh, Dr. Hickam, who's an American internist who died in 1970. He said, a patient can have as many diagnoses at one time as they damn well please. <laughs> That's Dr. Hickam. Hickam's dictum. That's yep. what they call it, Hickam's Dickon. And the other one was, it is more likely that a common disease will present in an uncommon way than an uncommon disease will present in a common way. And that was a quote of Dr. Gregory Henry. Yeah. Still is alive to the last, the best of our ability to under, understand that. Yeah. So, yeah, Greg, that's, this is one of your quotes from the past, and Dr. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my, uh, Pilcher basically quoted you. I uh, I uh, thank him for you remember rem that quote. Yes, I, I, and I thank him for remembering. the bo The bottom line is because there are, mo you know, I bet if we did took all the 70, 80, 90 year old women in the country and checked their abdomens and looked at, it, would there be fibroids somewhere? Yes. The question is, you got to ask yourself: Is the disease in front of me? Does does that fibroids doesn't rule out other diseases? And I think that's the real that's the real question here. Uh, the thing that's going to kill you is is the infection, the the appendicitis, that sort of thing, not the fibroids. In other I, words, you're saying you can have as many as, as many diagnoses as you damn well please. Absolutely. If you're sitting there thinking that that's going to get you out of trouble, the answer is no. And all the smart surgeons know that when they go in, they're they're prepared to do something else if they have to. I mean, you got to do something if you're going in there. What yeah, are you going to film for? Exactly. And if you think. That they, that they all haven't had that situation and that problem, you're wrong. They all have. And and the better we get with ultrasound and that sort of thing, what are we going to find? More disease of some kind that could be a problem. It doesn't mean that the old ones 
appendicitis, stuff like that, aren't still around. Oh, guys. Okay, I'm oh. sorry, Rachel. I just oh. looked, looked at the clock. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say quickly, this is a big pet peeve of mine. I see it all the time that we try to attribute various findings on transvaginal ultrasound to th like the patient's symptoms. You know, oh, there are cysts on the ovary. That's what's causing your pain. You know, I don't think people appreciate like the vast majority of ovarian cysts are not painful. Fighting cysts on the ovary does not mean that's why the patient's having pain. Exactly. I think people don't understand female reproductive organs. And like, if unless they understand them and feel like they have a good grasp on them, they should not be blaming symptoms on them. Yep. And, yeah, I, and, and I, peeve, I, huh? I... What's that? It's a pet, pet peeve. peeve. Oh, it's yeah. all the time. It's all the time. So It's all it's the time. Peeve. Yes, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The other thing is we want to uh, attribute all kinds of complaints to like one finding, and it isn't necessarily the case. You are allowed, as we pointed out, to have two diseases. You can four? have three or four. Five. You can have what you can have what you want. And uh, whoop, I, I've got to run for one minute. No, we're my, done. We're done. Uh, this no. issue is over. I got my wine of the month. We'll give two wines next month because I think we're. I wasn't really paying much attention here, or we can splice it in afterwards. But in All any right. case, you run it. I would. It, we have to go to the bathroom or something like that. No, 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 no. I was gonna. I, I was gonna <laughs> get my wine of the month, which is sitting in there. But uh, next time get, we'll do yeah. two next time. Oh my All right. god. Okay, Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate your. Your Bye, time Ricky. and your commitment. <laughs> you think it's a little too rushed? Uh, is this still being streamed? I think this is a great ending. It's real life. <laughs> <laughs> what was it's that? Do you have, you have to go to the bathroom for your prostate? Is it your prostate? Is yeah. that what you said? Yeah, I said, I asked him if it was his prostate. Can we, yes. can we end with that? No, no, it's not. It is not. Okay. So, Ricky, you don't think it's a professional enough ending? Is that what you think? <laughs> we just gave them a, a, an hour and a half of all this literature. R Ricky, <laughs> little Ricky raises a good point. Um, we can cut about the last two minutes off, and let's end it a little a little cleaner. Well, why don't you go get your notes then on the, on this wine that you, uh, is that what you're gonna get? Go get yes, I, I, hold on. Your prostate? Okay. Yeah. Maybe you just don't wanna say that.